Hello friends, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Nikhil Kashyap, Assistant Professor at Amity University. Today we will be discussing normative framework of sentencing, shared responsibilities between legislature and judiciary. The concept of norm was suggested by Kelson. He believed that there is a ground norm which will govern other norms. Normative framework of sentencing refers to the legislative framework created for sentencing in the form of punishments. The normative framework of sentencing aims at realizing the concept of equality and justice in the criminal legal system. There are two terminologies of criminal justice system, that is sentencing and punishment, which are interrelated and interdependent on each other. It can be said that the punishment is one of the purposes of sentencing. There are many other purposes of sentencing and one of them is reduction of crime. The modern legal system prescribes punishment based on severity of crime and sentencing guidelines aims at achieving the concept of equality in sentencing. The punishments and sentences denote the overlapping functioning of the legislature and judiciary. At one part, the sentencing is prescribed by the legislature and sentencing part is operated by judiciary. To reach the desired goal of consistency and justice in the legal system, it is necessary that the both the legislature as well as judiciary work in coordination with each other. The shift in the approach of the legal system is required. The need of the R is to move away from the orthodox concept of punishment and focus on the goal we want to attain through the criminal justice system. The pertinent question that remains unanswered is that what we are achieving from the sentence passed in a criminal trial. On most of the occasions, the convict does not know the purpose of the punishment he is going through, whether it is deterrent or reformative. The justice system should focus on the needs of the three stakeholders, victim, offender and society. The concept of fairness is not related to offenders only, but it includes victim as well as society at large. This module will be focusing on the legislative framework of sentencing. Further, this module will deliberate on the functioning of the sentencing mechanism in India. And lastly, the focus will shift on the role of legislature and judiciary in achieving the desired goal of justice through sentencing. Legislative framework of sentencing, an Indian perspective. The legislative framework of sentencing can be divided into two parts. One is the substantive, which is dealt by Indian Penal Code 1860, and the second part is the, the procedural aspect, which is dealt by Code of Criminal Procedure 1973. Sentencing is a wider word, and it is the prerogative of judiciary, whereas the punishment is prescribed by the legislature. Punishment under Indian Penal Code 1860. In the Indian Penal Code 1860, there is a dedicated chapter to deal with punishments, which is also known, which is known as of punishments. This chapter provides various kind of punishment that can be provided to a convict. Further, this chapter provides various nuances of the punishments like punishments in case fine is not paid, solitary confinement, etc. Under Indian Penal Code, originally there were six punishments, death, transportation for life, imprisonment for life, penal servitude, fine, imprisonment, rigorous or simple, for feature of property. There are only five punishments in the statute book today. They are death, imprisonment for life, imprisonment simple or rigorous, for feature of property, and fine. Transportation for life has been replaced with the imprisonment for life and penal servitude has been omitted from the Indian Penal Code in the year 1949. Death is also known as capital punishment. In other words, it is the highest punishment. There is a debate that there should be capital punishment in India or not as many jurisdictions across the world have removed death sentence. Recently, Law Commission of India has prescribed for the removal of the death sentence as punishment. But in the case of Jagmohan versus State of UP, constitutional bent, bench held that death penalty is, a, is constitutionally valid. Imprisonment for life is a kind of punishment which is provided to the offender for serious offences. Before 1955, the imprisonment for life was known as transportation for life. Imprisonment for life means that imprisonment for the rest of the life of the convicted person. There is a perception in the general public that the imprisonment for life is for 14 years or 20 years, which is a wrong perception. The Supreme Court has clarified the imprisonment of life means the remaining life of the convict. 
in Gopal Nayak, Gopal Vinayak Godse versus the state of Maharashtra and others, the Supreme Court held that a sentence of imprisonment for life means a sentence for the entire life of the prisoners unless the appropriate government chooses to exercise its power, its power or its discretion to remit either the whole or the part of the sentence under Section 401 of Code of Criminal Procedure. Along with Section 53, read with Section 45 IPC, it affirmed the legal position that the imprisonment only means the entirety of the life unless it is curtailed by remissions granted under the Code of Criminal Procedure by the appropriate government or under Article 72 or Article 171 of the Constitution by the executive head, that is the President of India or the Governor of the state, respectively. The paragraph cited above provided the clear picture of the existing law in the country with regard to imprisonment for life. The releasing of the accused under Article 72 and 161 of the Constitution are executive function rather than judicial function. Rigorous, rigorous punishment refers to the imprisonment with hard labor. The court can provide rigorous punish, imprisonment whenever the laws provide for it. The question is what does the term rigorous imply? The Supreme Court in Sunil Batra v. Delhi Administration held that sympathy and senses are not enemies of penal asylums. Further, the court stated that the word rigorous should be interpreted with the perspective of humanity and corrective measures. Simple imprisonment is provided for lighter offences in comparison to offences for rigorous imprisonment. One of the forms of the simple imprisonment is solitary confinement. Solitary confinement is provided under Section 73 of the Indian Penal Code 1860. Solitary confinement can be provided to the criminals who are getting along with the jail rules or who acquire hard corrective measures. This solitary confinement is not absolute. It has its own limitation under Section 74 of Indian Penal Code. For feature of property, another kind of punishment in which the convict loses the rights over the property for doing an act forbidden by law or not doing an act required by law to be done. For feature of property is majorly exercised for economic offences in which the recovery of money is to be made. Fine is the last kind of punishment which can be provided either with the imprisonment or without imprisonment. There is no limitation of fine but it can be excessive in nature. Further, the court provides the punishment for not paying the fine. Section 63 provides that there, where, there, where the fine is not prescribed by law, the discretion lies to the court to, to provide the fine. The Malimut Committee report stated the importance of adding new punishments in Indian Penal Code. The report reads as, since the IPC was enacted in, in the year 1860, many developments have taken place, new forms of crimes, new forms of crimes have take, come into existence. Punishments for some crimes are provided grossly inadequate and the need for imposing only fine as a sentence for smaller offences is felt. Variety of punishments prescribed is limited. It is pertinent to mention here that Law Commission of India in its 42nd report recommended some new forms of punishment that can be added in the Indian Penal Code. They are community service, disqualification from holding office, order of payment of compensation, public censure, etc. Sentencing under Indian uh, Criminal Procedure Code 1973. In the earlier discussion, we have discussed the substantive provisions of punishments and kinds of punishment. In this part, we will be focusing on the procedural aspect of sentencing. Section 235, 248, 360 and 361 of Code of, Crim Code of Criminal Procedure 1973 majorly deal with the sentencing power of the courts. Now let us discuss each provision in detail. Section 235 of CRPC deal with judgment of acquittal or conviction. Section 235 clause 2 of Code of Criminal Procedure makes it mandatory for the court to hear the accused on the question of sentence and then pass the sentence in accordance to the law. However, there are no sentencing guidelines provided by Code of Criminal Procedure. Such provision provides discretionary power to the courts to pass the sentence by as prescribed by law. Substantive law provides a range of punishment and the judge gets the power to pass the sentence with the limits prescribed by law. It is pertinent to note that this obligation of hearing the accused is a mandatory condition for passing a valid sentence. 
the Supreme Court of India in Shiv Mohan Singh versus State of Delhi held that hearing is obligatory at the sentencing stage. The humanist principle of individ indiv individualization, punishment to suit the person and his circumstances is best served by hearing the culprit even on the nature and quantum of the penalty to be imposed. Code of Criminal Procedure further provides provision for enhanced punishment in case of previous convictions. Section 236 and 248 Clause 3 of Code of Criminal Procedure provides provision with regard to enhanced punishment for convict. In case he or she does not admit his previous conviction, sec Section 236 provides enhanced punishment. In session trial and Section 248.3 provide enhanced punishment in warrants trial. Section 354, Clause 3 of Code of Criminal Procedure makes it mandatory for the courts to give reasons in the judgment when the conviction is done for an offence. Punishable with death or sentence of death is passed. Another pertinent provision of sentencing is Section 360. Code of Criminal Procedure is intended to be used to prevent young persons from being committed to jail where they may associate with hard uh, hardened criminals and who may lead them further along with the path of crime and, and to help even men of more mature years who for the first time may have committed crimes through ignorance or in, uh, inadvertence or the bad influence of others and who but for such lapses might be expected to be good citizens. It is not intended that this section should be applied to experienced men of the world who deliberately disobey the law and commit offences. In Jugal Kashor Prasad versus State of Bihar, the Supreme Court explained the rationale of the provision. The object of the provision, Section 360, is to prevent the conversion of youthful offenders into abdurate criminals as a result of their association with hardened criminals of mature age in the case the youthful offenders are sentenced to undergo imprisonment in jail. This section is based on the reformative theory of punishment. This aim of this provision is to avoid bad influence of the jail environment if there is a chance that the offender can be reformed or rehabilitated. In other words, this section aims not to send the first-time offender to prison for an offence, which is not of a serious character and thereby running the risk of turning him into a regular criminal. Section 360 Clause 1 provides the power to the court having regard to the age, character and antecedents of the offender and the circumstances in which the offence was committed. If the court convicting the accused person considers it's expedient to release the offender on probation of good conduct, instead of sentencing him at uh, once to any punishment, it may direct the offender to, the to be released on his entering into a bond with or without sureties to appear and receive sentence when called upon during such period, not exceeding three years. As the court may fix and in the meantime to keep the peace and be a good behaviour. Such a release is a permissible only if the following conditions are satisfied. There is no previous conviction proved against the offender. When the person convicted is a woman or of any age or any male person under under 21 years of age and the offence of which he or she convicted is not punishable with death or imprisonment for life. When the person convicted is not under the age under 21 years of age and the offence of which he is convicted is punishable with fine only or imprisonment for a term of seven years or less. It is important to understand the expression first offender refers to an offender who has no previous conviction to his credit apart from the offence in question. It is also necessary that the offence committed by him for the first time must be one of those mentioned in Section 360 of Code of Criminal Procedure. Offenders with any previous conviction or those found guilty of any offence punishable with death or imprisonment of life are totally beyond the purview of this section. From this section, it is clear that it tries to reform the criminals by treating them leniently only in those cases where there is no serious danger or threat to the perception or threat to the protection of society. It is important to note that no offender can as a matter of right on fulfilling the conditions laid down in this section claim to be rele released on probation of good conduct. It is a discretionary power given under this section to the court. This provision further provides the option to the court to release the offender. 
after admonition if the conditions are satisfied. In Section 360 Clause 3 of Code of Criminal Procedure is applicable on in respect of the specified offences and such other offences under the Indian Penal Code that are not punishable with more than two years of imprisonment. Under this subsection, the court has got the discretion to release the offender after admonition instead of sentencing him to any punishment. Section 360, Clause 8 of Code of Criminal Procedure and Section 360, Clause 9 of Code of Criminal Procedure state that in case the offender fails to observe the condition of his recogniz recognizance, the court which convicted the offender or any court which could have dealt with him in respect of his original offence may issue a warrant for his apprehension and when brought before it may either remand him in custody until the case is heard or admit him to bail with a sufficient surety after hearing the case past sentence. There is a Probation of Offenders Act which is enacted with aim to reform and rehabilitate the offenders in the society and it supplements Section 360 of Code of Criminal Procedure. It is pertinent to remember that Section 360 and Probation of Offenders Act are exclusive of each other. The Supreme Court in Channi versus State of Uttar Pradesh stated that the provision of these two statutes regarding probation have significant differences and they cannot coexist. Hence, provisions of Section 360 are wholly inapplicable in areas where probation of Offenders Act is made applicable. The difference between the two statutes is that Section 360 of the court relates only to persons not under, a, under 21 years of age convicted for an offence punishable with fine or only or with imprisonment for a term of seven years or less. To any person under 21 years of age or any woman convicted of an offence not punishable with sentence of death or imprisonment for life. The scope of section 4 of the Probation of Offenders Act is much wider. It applies to any person found guilty of having committed an offence not punishable with death or imprisonment for life. Therefore, the court held that the provision in the two statutes with significant differences could not be intended to coexist at the same time in the same area. Section 3 and 4 of the Probation of Offenders Act provides that release on admonition and release on the basis of good conduct of the offender in case the offence is not punishable with imprisonment for life or death respectively. Section 6 of Probation of Offenders Act is very important section with respect to juvenile delinquents. It provides an obligation for the courts to record reason for passing the sentence for a person who is not 21 years old. Per the second clause of the provision makes obligatory to call for the report from probation officer and consider the same for adjudicating on the character, mental character, etc. of the offender. Lastly, section 361 of CRPC provides that when the court had the option of dealing the offender under section 360 of Code of Criminal Procedure, the court does not deal the offender under section 360, the court has to record special reasons for the same. Though omissions to record special reasons as required by section 361 is an irregularity and may require the court of appeal or revision to set aside the sentence passed by the lower court if the irregularity has occasioned in failure of justice. In Santa Singh versus State of Punjab, it was observed by the Supreme Court and I quote, having regard to the object, there can be no doubt that it is one of the most fundamental parts of the criminal procedure and non-compliance thereof will ex vitiate the order of sentence. Even if it be, regard, it, it be regarded as an irregularity, the prejudice caused to the accused would be inherent and implicit because of the interaction of the rules of natural justice which have been incorporated in this statutory provision. Because the accused has been completely deprived of any of an opportunity to represent to the court regarding the proposed sentence and which manifestly results in a failure of justice. Now I would like to discuss role of, judi role of judiciary in sentencing. I would like to start with lines of Ju Justice Cardozo in his famous book Nature of Judicial Process where he defines the role of a judge is not based on his perceptions rather than on the ideals provided by the legal principles. He says, a judge, even when he is free, is still not wholly free. He is not to innovate at pleasure. He is not a knight, errant roaming at a will in pursuit of his own ideal of beauty and goodness. 
he is to draw inspiration from consecrated principles where a judge values those prevailing in society's clash the judge must in theory give way to the objective right he further state that the judge should be a judge by the objectivity of the right whenever there is a clash in his own values or or the society this concept of justice cardozo is further elaborated by supreme court in sc bhari versus state of bihar where the ep apex court is justifying disparity uh, in sentencing the court states that crime and punishment have a moral dimension of considerable complexity that must guide sentencing in any enlightened society the criticism of judicial sentencing has raised its head in various form that is inequitable as evidenced by desperate sentences that it is ineffective or that is unfair being either inadequate or in some cases harsh it has been often expressed there is a considerable disparity in sentence sentencing an accused found to be guilty for the same offense the sentencing variation is bound to reflect because of the because of the varying degrees of seriousness seriousness in the offenses and verifying characteristics of the offender himself moreover since no two offenses or offenders can be identical the charge or the label of variation as disparity in sentencing necessarily involves a value based judgment court end often the judiciary is criticized for having biases but the apex court has justified the disparity in sentencing as there as there is a difference in the degree of severity of the same offense this to an extent justifies the role of a judge the supreme court has further justified the sentencing disparity by suggesting a standard based on the society's cries of justice against criminal the judge should imagine the effect of the sentence on the convict while passing the sentence the judge should answer himself that is the sentence passed will help the convict or not secondly the judge needs to answer that the sentence answer the society's cry of justice or not it is very important that a judge should be sensitized with the effect of punishment on the criminal it will provide a better view to the judge in sentencing an accused jail visits or correction home visits etc can actually provide a real view on the effect of sentencing on the criminal trial in 47th report of law commission of india on the trial of punishment on the so of the social and economic offenses stated many factors for offenders like the nature of offense the circumstances extenuating and aggravating the offense the prior criminal record if any of the offender the age of the offender the professional social record of the offender the background of the offender with reference to education and home life etc the mental condition of the offender the prospective rehabilitation of offender the possibility or the treatment or training of the offender and the sentence by serving as a deterrent in the community for reoccurrence of the particular offense in indo china steam navigation company limited versus jasjeet singh additional collector of customs and others the apex court stated that the criminal law treats as punishment more as corrective and reformative rather than deterrent or punitive measure in tk gopal alias gopi versus state of karnataka has reiterated the doctrine of proportionality in which the victim suffering should be considered in sentencing it can be inferred that the judiciary is apprised with the fact that the sentencing is a very important aspect of the criminal trial while passing a sentence a judge should consider aggravating factors mitigating factors profile of the offender victim and societal considerations at large now we'll be coming on legislative vis-a-vis the judicial role in sentencing sentencing is a very wide term it has its relationship with punishments punishments are prescribed in substantive law whereas the passing of a sentence is of part of a procedural law there is a very delicate balance in the working of judiciary and legislature on sentencing as legislature prescribes a punishment and judiciary passes the sentence within the limit of punishment prescribed by legislature in vikram singh versus union of india the apex court has summed up the role of judiciary and legislature on sentencing and punishment the court held that and i quote punishment must be proportionate to the nature and gravity of the offense for which the same are prescribed prescribing punishment is a function of the legislature and not the courts 
the legislature is presumed to be sup supremely wise and aware of the needs of the people and the measures that are necessary to meet those needs. Courts shows deterrence to the legislative will and wisdom and are slow in upsetting the enacted provisions dealing with the quantum of punishment prescribed by the different offences. Courts, how, however, have the jurisdiction to interfere when the punishment prescribed is so outrageously disproportionate to the offence or so inhuman or brutal that the same cannot be accepted by any standard of decency. Absence of objective standards for determining the, determining the legality of prescribed sentence makes the job of the court reviewing the punishment difficult. Courts cannot interfere with the prescribed punishment only because the punishment is perceived to be excessive. In dealing with questions of proportionality of sentences, the capital punishment is considered to be different in kind and degree from the sentence of imprisonment. The result is that while there are several instances when capital punishment has been considered to be disproportionate to the offence committed, there are, various, there are very few and rare cases of sentences of imprisonment being held disproportionate." End quote. It is important to note here that the prescribing punishment is a role of legislature. Further in State of MP versus Bala, Bala the court held that the punishment prescribed by the penal code reflect the legislative recognition of the societal needs and the gravity of the offence concerned, its impact on society and, the, and what the legislator considers as a punishment suitable for the particular offence. It is necessary for the courts to imbibe that legislative wisdom and to respect it." End quote. The Supreme Court has categorically stated that the courts need to respect the legislative wisdom and its legislation. This, is, this creates a very delicate balance between judiciary and legislature. Furthermore, the Committee of Reforms of Criminal Justice System 2003, that is Malimut Committee established by Government of India to recommend changes in the criminal justice system in India, had observed that the judges were granted wide discretion in awarding the sentence within the statutory limits and there is no guidance in sentencing the most appropriate sentence in the given factual situation thereof. There was no uniformity in awarding of sentence as the discretion was exercised according to the judgment of every judge. The Malimut Committee stated that, and I quote, the Indian Penal Court prescribes offences and punishment for the same. For many offences, only the maximum punishment is prescribed and for some offences, the minimum may be prescribed. The judge has a very wide discretion in awarding the sentence within the statutory limits. There is now no guidance to the judge in regard to selecting the most appropriate sentence given the circumstances of the case. Therefore, each judge exercises discretion according to his own judgment. There is therefore some judges are lenient and some judges are harsh. Exercise of unguided discretion is not good even if it is the judge that exercises the discretion. In some countries, guidance regarding sentencing option is given in the, in, in the penal code and sentencing guidelines laws. There is need for such law in our country to minimize uncertainty to the matter of awarding sentence. End quote. The Malimut Committee also stated the importance for sentencing guidelines and also suggested the composition of the committee that should draft the guidelines. The committee report states, sometimes the courts are unduly harsh, sometimes they are liberal and we have already adverted two aspects which Supreme Court said are relevant in deciding as to what are the rarest of the rare cases for imposing death sentence and even in such matters uniformly is lacking. In certain rape cases, acquittals gave rise to public protest. Therefore, in order to bring about certain regulation and predictability in the matter of sentencing, the committee recommends a statutory committee to lay guidelines on sentencing under the chairmanship of a former judge of Supreme Court or a chief just, former chief justice of a high court experienced in criminal law with other members representing the prosecution, legal profession, police, social scientist and women representative. The solution suggested by the committee was to formulate sentence, sentencing guidelines which can provide standards for sentencing in India. 
there are no sentencing guidelines in India. The only guiding principle for the courts is the judgments provided by the Supreme Court, various high courts, etc. The court should impose a punishment befitting the crime so that the courts are able to accurately reflect public abhorrence of the crime. It is the nature and gravity of the crime and not the criminal which are germane for consideration of appropriate punishment in a criminal trial. Imposition of sentence without considering its effect on the social order in many cases may be in reality a futile exercise. The survival of an orderly society demands the extinction of a life of a person who is proved to be menace to the social order and security. Thus the courts for the purpose of deciding just an appropriate sentence to be awarded for an offence have to delicately balance the aggravating and mitigating factors and circumstances in which a crime has been committed, committed in a dis dispassionate manner. From the above discussion, it can be said that the prescribing a punishment is a legislative function, but passing an appropriate sentence is a judicial function. The need of the R is to have sentencing guidelines to reduce the disparity in sentencing as well as achieving the goal of uniformity in the criminal justice system. I would like to conclude by saying every system has some scope of improvement as no system is perfect. There have been allegations against the judiciary with regard to disparity in sentencing sentences passed by them. These allegations may not be absolutely wrong. In, er, in the earlier part of this module, we have discussed various nu nuances of sentencing and punishment and the role of judiciary and legislature in the same. There can be various reasons for disparity in sentences for the same offence like biases, preconceived notions or the natural behaviour of the judge or severity of the offence committed etc. The above list is not exhaustive but it hints towards many important aspects of sentencing. There is no absolute system for eradicating all the reasons of disparity in sentencing but there can be some measures that can be taken at legislative as well as judiciary level. The legislatures need to draft sentencing guidelines which provide stability and uniformity in the system. These guidelines will be helpful for the judges in deciding the punishment for any offence the judicial academies across India can be ordered to provide refresher courses on sentencing and punishment. These aspects should be included in induction training for judicial officers. Further sensitization of judges through jail visits, rehabilitation, home visits, etc. should be initiated at a state and central level. I hope you had a great learning experience. Thank you.